So in chapter 20, there's another transition with Sam. He gets to do something he's been waiting for and wondering about for so long. Does anyone want to predict what that is? But if you read it already, you can't tell. So only for people who haven't read it yet. Brian. What do you think? Something Sam's really been wondering about. What do you think it is? Caitlin. Um, that he might go to the village with Mama Talk. And that he might him. finally get to go see the what, Connor? The new city plans, because I was thinking back in the story how he wanted to use a gun. Mm. Oh, okay. But he wanted he to use the gun. There is a weapon in this chapter, but it's not a gun. Yes. The, um, I can't pronounce this, like the line. Wero, Mocha. And you know what? With these proper nouns, is it so important we pronounce it perfectly? No. No, because they don't affect our comprehension. Okay, without further ado, let's begin. What page are we on, boys and girls? Chapter 20. Thus did they show their feats of arms, and others art and dancing. Some other us their oaten pipe and others' voices chanting. And I think it's some other used their oaten pipe. And other others' voices chanting. Who said that? Uh, William Simmons. Good. All right. The morning we are to leave for Ware Wakamoko, I am jittery with excitement. Namatok is, too. It will be his first time home since he went to England. He will have lots of stories to tell his people. You will love my home, he says to me. It is, I know, I interrupt him, it is much better than my home. And we both laugh. Namatok collects the gifts he's received in England. A red velvet cassock, so it looks something like this, but it's red. Which he says isn't as warm as a deerskin mantle. A pewter chalice, which looks like this which he says isn't as good as a gourd to drink out of, and here are their gourds, or something similar to that. An ivory tooth scraper, which you can picture as like our dental or our toothpicks that cleans your teeth, which he refuses to use because he says the Indian way of cleaning his teeth with sassafras root is much better. I gather my spoon and bowl and a water skin. <coughs> you see the picture of a water skin? It's kind of dark up there, but it's made of um, leather, and it's tied together, and it holds their, their water. Um, we present ourselves to Captain Smith, each with a small bundle to carry. Captain Smith looks up from cleaning his musket. Samuel, where is your sword? Where is your armor? Go back and get properly attired. I thought we were at peace with the problems, I want to say. So it's in, what do we call that writing? Uh, a challenge. Why? Because he's thinking. He's thinking. Yeah, he's like going through in his mind what that's Ooh. saying. I want to say that I know better than to argue with Captain Smith. So I simply go to my cabin and do as he says. At least he is not making me carry my heavy musket on the hike to the Werewakamoko. When I get back to Captain Smith's cabin, the carpenter John Layton is sitting out front with his tools working at making a small wooden chest. He is carving initials at the top of the chest. He already has an A, and as I watch, he finishes a B. Who is that for? I ask. He keeps his eyes cast down, intent on his work, and he does not answer me. And then it dawns on me. I tip my head close into his. Is it for her? I whisper. He glances at me and I see he is afraid to tell me, afraid I will announce it and give it to the other men a chance to ridicule him. I look at the small chest. It is beautifully crafted out of cherry wood, a work of love. I watch him as he begins to carve a border around the initials. John Layton is a quiet man. He is sturdy, and kind, and he is the only man who has decided to woo Miss Andrus with something other than bragging and strutting. I lean close again. She likes flowers too, I say. He gives me a quick smile and continues his work. Captain Smith is ready to go. He carries his musket, 
and has not one but two bandoliers of gunpowder strung across his chest. His sword hangs at his side, and he is wearing full armor. Can you picture that? You visualize those descriptions, what he looks like? Does he have anything across his chest? Yes. The gunpowder. Gunpowder and what else? Um, his armor. metal armor. armor. Very good. He looks like he's going into battle, not like he's visiting someone to invite them to come get some presents. This crowning of Powhatan must truly be a bad idea. There are only six of us going. Me, Captain Smith, Namatak, and three soldiers. We hike over land for about 12 miles. When we come to the Pamukki River, Pamukki River, which separates us from Werewakamoko, we find a canoe in the rushes and use it to paddle across. When we reach the other side, I see nothing but tall, grand trees with their leaves turning red and gold. Come, says Namata, Peagua. A worn footpath brings us into the woods, and soon I smell the smoke from cook fires. Namatak breathes deeply and smiles. He is coming home. We come to where the houses of the Werewakamoko are gathered. Straw-covered, rectangled houses with curved roofs. There are at least 20 of them scattered among the trees with gardens in between. They are about the size of ours, but made of rushes woven together. Three small boys run out to greet us. Namatak lifts the littlest one into the air, and he laughs, and he says in Algonquian, You grew so much while I was gone. You must have eaten a whole bear. More people from the village come to see who has arrived. Captain Smith speaks with one of the elders. He tells him, We have gifts for Chief Powhatan, brought from England. Will the great chief come to Jamestown to receive his gifts? The elder chief says, the Chief Powhatan is in another village 30 miles away. He will send for him immediately, but he will not arrive until tomorrow. I'm relieved. We do not have to anger Chief Powhatan quite yet. It is beginning to get dark, and the air is filled with chirping of crickets and cicadas. The elder motions for us to follow him, and he leads us to a field. Two young boys lay down mats for us to sit on, and they build a fire. Are we beginning, are we being invited for supper? Are they about to start cooking the fire? I wonder. We sit on the mats, and various people from the village come to sit near us. A few old men and women, many children and young warriors. They are all silent, their faces expectant, as if they are waiting for something to happen. But no one brings food to cook on the fire. My stomach begins to churn. What does that tell us about him? He's what? He's hungry. hungry. He's hungry. Does it come right out and say, I am so hungry? No. Oh, that's a great way to say it. My stomach begins to churn. What is going on? What are they expecting to happen? I'm glad I have my sword. But what are they going to do with us? Captain Smith sits on the mat next to me. His eyes are wary, and I know that he... Two, suspects this might be a trap. I touch his sleeve. What are they doing? I whisper. Suddenly, shrieking and howling erupt from the forest. The same battle cries I heard the night James was killed. I leap to my feet and I pull out my sword, ready to fight and slash. Captain Smith draws his sword. He seizes an old man sitting near us and holds the sword to his throat. Our soldiers aim their muskets into the dark forest. The howling comes closer and louder. Our attackers will be upon us at any moment. Out of the shadows, a little girl comes running. She rushes up to us and stands bravely in front of the loaded muskets. It is Pocahontas. I promise no harm will come to you, she says, holding out her hand, her palms up. If I am wrong, you may kill me. Captain Smith lets go of the old man. He translates what Pocahontas has said for the soldiers, and they slowly lower their muskets. 
All right, Captain Smith says, still looking wary. Pocahontas recognizes me and smile, smiles. He comes, she comes to me and Captain Smith and gives us that same look of expectancy I've been seeing all evening. Just watch, she says. Then in English, she adds, you like. I grin. Captain Smith must have taught her some English during her visits to our fort and his visits to her village. She shakes, she takes our hands, pulls us both down onto our mats, and she settles in between us. The fire casts a moving light. Into that firelight leaps a form. Is it a buck? I blink. It is a woman. She is wearing the horns of a buck. Another woman leaps into the light, then another and another all dancing, shrieking their battle cries, their bodies painted white, black, and red. Some wear buck's horns on their heads, and each carries a weapon. One a club, another a sword, another a bow and arrows. The young women leap and whirl around the fire, their battle cries now mixing with the music of drums and rattles. They bring the night alive with their warrior's dance. I watch, spellbound. It is magic. The music and dancing last for at least an hour. Then the women run off into the darkness of the forest, shrieking the same way as they came. There is a moment of hushed silence. Then everyone starts talking and laughing with children running and playing and everyone getting up from their mats. Pocahontas looks at me, her eyes glowing. Did you like it? She asks an Algonquin. Quinn. I nod enthusiastically. Wow! I say, this is a new Algonquian word I learned from Namatak. Wow is their word for wonder and awe. and is definitely the best word to describe what I have seen. I have heard about these masquerades in England with their grand costumes and music and acting, but only nobles are allowed to see them. Now I have seen a new world masquerade while sitting next to a princess. With torches lighting our way, Pocahontas leads us back into the village to one of the houses. There, the young women dancers join us, still in their costumes of body paint. They all act as if they are in love with Captain Smith and our soldiers. They crowd around them, giggling and saying in English, Love you, not me? Love you, not me? I raise my eyebrows at Pocahontas. Who teaches them that? I ask. And she gives me an impish look, and she shrugs. I smell something delicious. And I turn to see several older women bringing in platters of food. There are large wooden bowls of steaming beans, peas, and squash, plas platters of roasted fish and venison, baskets of bread and fruit. What is it? A feast. I eat until I can't stuff in another when Amatok sees me yawning, he takes me by the shoulders and he steers me toward the door. You will sleep in my house tonight, he says. Outside the night air is brisk, but when we enter Namatok's house, it's toasty warm from the fire in the middle of the dirt floor. How many of you can picture that from our trip to Jamestown? Yeah, and they have the opening at the top so that the air can circulate. Um, the smoke gathers in the high ceiling and escapes through the hole in the roof. Lining the walls, there are platforms made with poles, reed mats, and skins. I see that Namatok's brother, the three little boys who greeted him when we arrived, are already asleep on the platforms. He points to where I sleep, I will sleep, next to the smallest boy. He gives me a deerskin blanket to keep me warm. As I lie on the bed, I can still hear the talking and laughing coming from the house where the feast was going on. Namatuck is right, I think. His home is much better than Jamestown. There's more food, and there's more joy to be had in one night here than a whole year in Jamestown. Thomas Savage only stayed for a little while in Werewakamoko. Why did he not beg to be allowed to stay forever? I wish I could come here to live. I would learn the Algonquian language even better, and I'd be able to train and help the colony. Namatok could teach me to make a bow and arrows and to shoot straight. I could hunt and help feed us. 
I wonder if that is what Reverend Hunt means about making decisions out of love. Love for our newfound Indian friends. Love for our fragile new world colony. And I remember when we first landed in Virginia, and again the night of the Indian raid, how I thought I hated all of these natives, and I wanted their, our men to shoot them and kill them. Those thoughts seem so strange to me now, now that Namatak has become my friend, and Chief Powhatan has rescued us from the cold and starvation, and Princess Pocahontas has treated us as her countrymen. This new world is a good place to live, I think, as long as we live in peace with the Powhatan people. And then I remember how Captain Smith dressed as a warrior to bring the news of the coronation to Chief Powhatan, how he said his news would not sit well with the chief. And I wonder how long the peace and love will last.